Hey, it's great to see you. My name is Daniel, by the way. I'm a pastor here at Woodlands Community Church. And I just want you all to know you made a great choice to get up and get here today because you've already experienced the presence of God in worship. And now we are going to dig into the Word of God. And we have like, well, look at this right here. Well, thank you, Larry. I appreciate that. Give a hand to Larry. All right. How about that? All right. All right. Thanks, Larry. Watch it. We're going to dig into God's Word, and we've got a word for you today to encourage you and challenge you, and your life may be very different by the end of the day today because of the Word of God that we have to share with you. As a matter of fact, um, but oh, I'm sorry. First of all, I don't want to forget our online guest. Hey, everybody watching online, welcome. Let's give him a great big welcome, Woodlands. Great to have you all with us. Hey, last week um, was actually, the, this is the third week we've been streaming live on Facebook. So uh, you can catch us on Facebook on any given week. Go to our, uh, our Woodlands Facebook page and just uh, click on it right from there and watch us live whenever you're out of town, uh, you know, or if you're home not feeling well, uh, that kind of thing. Um, but we had, we had 24 different households uh, that clicked in and joined us last week from all over the Midwest. So thank you for joining us. I'm sure we got at least that many or more today. So welcome everybody great to have you and it's just great to have our online working again thanks to our amazing new creative arts director garrett ivy we appreciate you so much garrett um, and the great work that you're already doing been here a couple weeks and the guy's just killing it just killing it so um we're going to begin a new series today or actually it, it, it's not exactly a new series as much as it's the continuation of a series we started back in the summer it's called following jesus now i've got good news for you uh, some of you may be thinking oh great am i going to be lost no, if you're here today for the first time, or if you're newer to Woodlands, um, just yeah, all of these messages are self-contained, so you'll be able to follow along, you know, just perfectly, perfectly well. But if you do want to catch some of the earlier messages in this series, following Jesus in the Gospel of Luke, uh, they're all online at woodlands.cc, so you can check it out at woodlands.cc. Um, so, but let me ask you a question, and it's going to be a familiar question to those of you who have been here over the last few weeks. How many of you know that life is a battle? Huh? How many of you all know that? That life is a battle, right? It sounds familiar, doesn't it? Because um, if you remember our Mastermind series uh, that we just completed, you know that we talked about how life is a battle, and most of that battle uh, takes place in the mind. I would compare it to an iceberg. Many of you know the illustration of an iceberg. An iceberg, you only see about 10 percent of an iceberg above ground okay whatever you see above the ocean about 90 percent of the iceberg is actually underneath the water okay and that's what the battle of the mind is like okay because the battle of life about 90 percent of it takes place in the mind uh, because we have to fight in life you've got to fight for your family folks you got to fight for your marriage. You've got to fight for your kids, okay? These are things that, that we know to be true. Now, um, uh, the, the story that unfolds in the Bible is really a, a battlefield. It's a, it's a war that's been raging since the beginning of time for all of human history. You see, according to the Bible, there were spirit beings, angels, that were created by God. And these angels were created by God to serve him, to worship him, and also to serve his highest creation, which are us, which are us, which happens to be us. Uh, the, the <laughs> I talk good, don't I? Um, and, so, um, and, and, and so these angels were created to serve God's highest creation, which is human beings. Uh, but here's a problem. One of those angels, a very high-ranking angel, maybe the highest in all of heaven, his name was Lucifer, which means beautiful. He was a beautiful angel. But he rebelled against God in, in the beginning of the world. And he wasn't content to serve and worship the one true God. No, instead, he wanted to be the one to be worshipped. Now, you're going to see scriptures pop up here uh, along the way. I think that Isaiah 14, 12 passage should pop up. Is that, is that coming up? There it is. All right. When you see that come up, our internet's working really slow this morning. I'm not sure what the problem is, but uh, I'm sure we'll get it fixed this week. Um, it'll be good to go for next week. Um, I'm not going to refer to these as much. I just want you to know for the first one, when you see these references, these references are, are scriptures that you can read 
to uh, see more background on things that I'm going to be referring to today. If I took the time to went to every to go to every scripture, uh, then you know we'd be here. You know we that hour we gained we would lose it. I'm just telling you. Okay, um, so just so you know, when you see those scriptures pop up today, they are here to reference what I'm talking about and to give you know biblical background support to the things that I'm saying. So so um, we know we know this angel. This one who was an angel, we call, as a, again, as, as an angel, he was named Lucifer, but he goes by many, many names in Scripture. Besides Lucifer, he's also known as Satan, or the dragon, the serpent, the enemy, the devil. He's known as the tempter, murderer, the father of lies, our adversary, our accuser, the destroyer, and the evil one. Dude's got a lot of names, right? Tragically, though, here's what happened. One third of the angels that God had created rebelled with Satan, joined Lucifer's army, if you will, and fought against the Holy One and against God's holy angels. And I'll refer to the holy angels as the ones who uh, continued their service and worship of the one true God who created them. Uh, but um, as they declared war on God, um, they became devoted to destroying God's kingdom. Now, their rebellion, Lucifer and his angels, it climaxed in a great battle in heaven between God and his holy angels, as I said. Now, Satan and most of his demons lost, and so they were kicked out of heaven without ever having an option to be reconciled uh, into a right relationship with God. And so, um, after that great war in heaven, what happened was the scene shifted to earth. It shifted to earth, and we find this battle re-engaged in the Garden of Eden. This is in Genesis chapters 1, 2, and 3. And in the Garden of Eden, uh, we see that um, Satan shows up when God's, uh, the apex of his creation, Adam and Eve, uh, were gathered there in the garden. And in the garden, as Adam met Eve, a wedding took place, and they were married, and they became the first couple. But it was once they were married that the old deceiver showed up all over again. Now, how many of you know the devil doesn't show up until after the wedding? Hmm? How many of y'all know that, right? Hey, how many of you are sitting there going, huh? know what you're saying, Pastor, I married the devil. Come on now. <laughs> you're sitting right next to me, all right? But after, um, so here's the thing. Satan always shows up to ruin what God made beautiful. It's just what he does. He tries to show up and ruin what God made beautiful. And he tries to turn people away from these loving relationships with God and with one another. So I can assure you, every time that your relationships are in a mess, husbands, wives, parents, children, teenagers especially, whenever it's in a mess, Satan and his minions are at work. All right? Because God made your relationships to be beautiful. But the evil one hates beauty, and he hates beautiful relationships. So their goal is to destroy your relationships. Always, always, always. So even though our first parents, Adam and Eve, failed, because uh, many of you may know the story, uh, they were tempted in the garden by the tempter, the evil one, Satan, and they gave in to that temptation. And I'll come back to that in a, little, in a, little, in a moment. But God made us a promise. God made us a promise there in the Garden of Eden. He foretold the coming of Jesus that he would crush the head of Satan. Now in Genesis chapter 3 verse 15 is where we pick this up. This, by the way, is the first prophecy in the Bible about Jesus who will come from heaven and become a man and live on this earth as a human being. Verse 15 of Genesis 3. I will make you and the woman hostile toward each other. By the way, this is God, and he's talking to Satan. And so he tells Satan, I'm going to make you and the woman hostile toward each other. Now, how many of you ladies love handling snakes? 
Yeah, see, that's kind of built in from the fall, right? I mean, I, I, I haven't met too many men that like being around snakes either, by the way. Let's just call it what it is, okay? Uh, but there is definitely this thing about snakes that most people are like, uh, you know, never forget Indiana Jones, right? Why did it have to be snakes? You know, I mean, he just, that, that, why, snakes are just like, uh. And so God said this from the beginning. There's going to be this enmity. There's going to be this war. There's this division, uh, this, this anger, this hostility uh, between you. And then he says, I will make your descendants and her descendants hostile toward each other. He, now he's, refer- who's he? he? He comes out of nowhere and says, he, he is Jesus. He's referring to Jesus, the one who is to come, the son of the woman. He will crush your head. And he fulfilled that on the cross. When Jesus died on the cross as a substitutionary death, He paid the price for all of your sins, all of my sins, all the world's sins. And in that moment, he crushed any hold that Satan would have on any of us, right? Because it is through the free gift of salvation that Jesus offers us that Satan can have no hold on that. Again, more on that later. Uh, But he will bruise your heel, okay? And that's exactly what Satan did. When Jesus went to the cross, he suffered terribly, terribly, terribly. His heel was bruised. But what happened after that? What happened after this scene in the garden? Satan seethed. He seethed and and his anger simmered and boiled for century after century, millennia after millennia, for many years until Jesus was born on earth. And, and, And we see the evil one. He waited patiently for his opportunity. And don't you think for a second that the evil one with his strategies isn't waiting patiently to catch you off guard too. He's trying to, he's waiting, he's waiting. I'm gonna show you in a minute how you can, how you can battle against that, how you can defend against that. The, um, he did, Satan did not openly attack Jesus until he received his public ministry calling. And what was that? Well, if you remember, and again, um, this kind of goes back uh, to the last message we did in this series, and that was the baptism of Jesus. When Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist, John the Baptizer, and he came up out of the water, we heard these great words, you are my son whom I love, with you I am well pleased. This was the anointing of Jesus for the beginning of his public ministry. And here we see in Luke chapter 4 what immediately follows that public calling. And that is the temptation of the evil one. And so that's where we're going to be today, Luke chapter 4. If you're going to go ahead and turn there, you'll be ready when we we, uh, move to that passage. Jesus, who's called the last Adam, by the way, picks up the war where the first Adam failed. See, Adam was born with no sin. He's the only one besides Jesus who was ever born with no sin, he and Eve. And he lived in paradise. He enjoyed a close friendship with God. He was tempted by Satan, but he failed. And then he was cast out of paradise into a lonely wilderness. Jesus came with no sin nature. He left paradise. He enjoyed a close relationship with God. He was tempted by Satan, but he did not not fail. The second Adam, Jesus, he defeated the dragon in that lonely wilderness, paving the way to paradise for all of us. And so if you look uh, in your Bible, again, uh, uh, you'll see in Luke chapter 3, we see that baptism account of Jesus. And as I said, the, the, the Spirit descended on Jesus, the Father spoke to him, and then, and then we see what happened Right after this, this was the most remarkable revelation in history. This, this anointing of Jesus at his baptism. But immediately after that, Jesus faced the toughest temptation in history. And it just goes to show, folks, that sometimes our greatest temptations come after our greatest successes. Anybody here know what I mean? Amen. You know what I'm talking about? You see, sometimes success is harder to deal with than failure. And we see that all the time. I don't know, how, in my lifetime, uh, which, is, which is, you know, going, going you know, into uh, you know, uh, six decades now. Um, I'm impressed I can count that high, aren't you? Um, that, that we, 
I have seen so many musical artists, so many actors and actresses. I've seen so many famous people, sports legends, right, who achieve terrific success. And at the apex of their career, they go through a nervous breakdown. They fall off the hill. Some, some commit suicide. I mean, success is very, very difficult to handle. But why is that? Because the serpent slithers in to strike at success. Because when you're successful, your guard is down and pride starts to creep in. And pride is at the, at the core of, of many, many of our problems and difficulties. Guys, see, that's why prayer is so incredibly important. Because you see, one thing that I've noticed about Christians over the year, about churches over the years, is that whenever we've got a big event coming up, whether it's as a church or whether it's in your life personally, I mean, as Christian people, we know what to do, don't we? We pray, 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 pray. Man, we pray like crazy. We want this to go well. If it's an event at church, we want to see all kinds of people being invited who don't know the Lord, and, and, and maybe they'll come to faith, and, and they might, we might see a, a bunch of people uh, you know, re- receive Jesus and, and you know, they want to get baptized, and it's a great thing. You know, maybe in your home, you're praying on something that's happening there. It's over your marriage. You're praying over your marriage. Is this the right woman? Is this the right guy? God, make sure I marry the right person. We're praying, 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 praying. But once we achieve whatever it is we want to achieve, oftentimes our prayer just kind of falls off. In the church, I've seen this in the many of the churches that I've served in, where we pray like crazy up to an event, the event happens, and everybody just goes home. What happened to all the prayer meetings and prayer events that happened in order to make that event come together, right? But if you look at Jesus, this is not the model we received from the Holy One of God. You will notice if you look at the life of Jesus in the Gospels, over and over again, we find Jesus after he has just accomplished some great miracle that set the world on fire, after he has just some, done something that was so incredible it left everybody in awe and, and, and more, more and more crowds uh, came to want to see him and be touched by him and to hear him, over and over again, he went away to a lonely place to pray. And those are the words you will see in Scripture over and over again. He went to a lonely place to pray. And that's what we need to do. We need to be sure that we are consistently going to a place to pray. Before the event, after the event. Leading up to the success, and even more so after the success. Um, I listened to a... uh, I listened to a... uh, um, uh, an interview this week on YouTube with a guy named John Ramirez. Now it was it was kind of it was a very different kind of uh, uh, interview because John Ramirez, y'all know, it was Halloween this past week, and you know Christian people have lots of opinions about Halloween. You know you, they, they run from one side all the way to the other. You know in terms of, of of Halloween and all. But this guy, he caught my attention because he grew up as a Satanist. He grew up in the church of Satan, and he grew up in what he called the army of Satan, and he said that he was a general in Satan's army. He said that when he was born, that his dad was a warlock. Now, some of y'all think witches and warlocks is just something out of movies or fairy tales. I I, I gotta tell you folks, it's very, very real. The fastest growing religion in America today is Wiccan. Wiccan is the cult the occult that witches and warlocks gather together in, okay? John Ramirez said for 25 years he served in the church of Satan. For 25 years he served as a general in Satan's army. And he said that at nine years old he was groomed for, he was being groomed for leadership. Uh, that he saw all of the horrors that you can even imagine that you hear about with um, 
you know, satanic sacrifice and, and all of this sort of thing. He said he was radically saved by Jesus. He knew that he was dead. He knew that his time with Satan, you know, that he was dead. Satan was, was, was a dead end. And he, and he cried out to Jesus and said, Jesus, if you can save me after all I've done and all I've seen and all I've participated in, then I ask you to save me. And he said he was radically, radically saved by Jesus Christ at that point. Now, my point about John Ramirez is not really talk about Halloween. Okay, that's already passed. Um, he did have some things to say, though, that I think would be healthy for all of us to listen. And one, just one thing that you might want to keep in mind when it comes to Halloween, it's this. He said, there is no other day in the calendar year when the church of Satan is more excited than on Halloween. Just take that and think about it and think about how that applies, you know, to your life. And, and uh, uh, of course, you can look him up, John Ramirez on YouTube. Um, you know, and he's, he's kind of out there, I'll tell you that much. I had to listen to it and go, ah, really? I don't know, yeah. But there's one thing he said that absolutely stuck to my heart, and it applies to our message today, and that is this. He said, Satan is after your time. He said, Satan is after your time. And man, I tell you what, that hit me like a boulder. And I got thinking, because that is something I've been dealing with myself over the past year or two. Because I think, you know, I, I think about the work that I do. You guys know, I'm a pastor. I do spiritual work all week long, right? I mean, as, as, as my friends like to say, Dan, Daniel, you're paid to pray, you know? <laughs> it's kind of a weird thing, isn't it? You know, um, I mean, I, 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 I do Christian work for a living, okay? And, and, and I work hard. I work long hours. I give my very, very best uh, to this church and to all of you that I have to give. And I feel confident about that. But when I go home, I'm tired. You know, and, and my routine is typically to go home. I'm an empty nester. You know, Ruthie and I will have, uh, you know, a, a meal together, that kind of thing. We'll sit down, we'll watch some television together, or we'll watch separate programs, you know, whatever that may be. And I just kind of sit and watch TV for an hour or two. And I've been praying about that. Like, God, you know, I, I don't know where I'm going to get more time, but I'm praying God redeem my time. And so what I want to give to you today is ask God to redeem your time. How are you spending your time? I've spent so much time watching sports over the years. You know, I watched so many basketball games and so many football games and, uh, uh, you know, and, and baseball games and, and that sort of thing. Satan is after your time. And by that, what I took him to mean was he wants you to use your time to do things that are not worthwhile. He wants you to use your time on things that are not productive. He wants you to use your time on things that have no effect in expanding the kingdom of God. And so I've, just, I've been really praying on this. And, and so what I've been trying to do more and more is uh, spend more time reading on books that I know will help me be a better leader, a better pastor, a better Christian, a better father, a better husband, okay? And, and reading things about the church and how to help the church grow by reaching lost people, reaching people who are far from God, you know? And so I invite you to consider praying, redeem my time. And I especially recognize the need to pray. And uh, it's, been, it's been three or four years ago, actually five years ago, we started doing 21 days of prayer um, here at Woodlands. We do it in January, and we do it again in August. And I am absolutely convinced that, that time of prayer that we do is absolutely critical to anything good that God does here. We also have added a prayer time on Saturday morning at 9 o'clock. And here's what I want to ask you to do. Every single one of you. I am getting really tired of praying by myself. I really am. But I will be here every single Saturday to pray for you and to pray for the Sunday service because that's its purpose. And I want to invite you to redeem your time. I want to invite you to consider what you were doing on Saturday mornings. When I first started coming on Saturday morning to pray, I was just like, oh man, it's Saturday morning, really? What a hassle. You know, I got to get up, you know, and get over here by nine o'clock, whatever. You know, now it's just my routine. You know, when people ask me, what are you doing on Saturday? Well, I have prayer at nine, you know, and, and I, wouldn't, I wouldn't miss it. I wouldn't miss it, you know, and I'm inviting you to join me, folks, because we need to pray. 
And we need to pray against the evil one because he has a plan and a strategy and he is working to take you down. He hates you. He hates your family. He hates your marriage. He hates your children. He hates your lineage. He hates everything about you. He hates every prayer that you utter. But if you're a Christian and you call yourself a follower of Christ and you aren't spending any time in prayer, and you aren't spending any time passing on a spiritual legacy to your children, and if you aren't reaching out and serving people who are in need around you, and if you are not connecting with your neighbors, especially those who are far from God, I got to tell you, Satan really doesn't care about you at all. And if Satan doesn't care about you at all, you are in a very, very, very dangerous place as a follower of Christ. You see, before Jesus graduated to his public ministry, he had to take one final test. His test was his temptation. You see, the temptation of Christ was the testing of Christ. We learn from Luke that to walk with God is to walk into war. If you're walking with God, you're walking into war. Thankfully, God gives us weapons for spiritual warfare. Now, we just spent four weeks talking about our divine weapons that help us demolish strongholds. So I'm not going to go over that much here. If you missed that, you can catch the last two weeks online at woodlands.cc. But here was the key verse we looked at in the Mastermind series. From 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 4 and 5, it says, We do not wage war as the world does. The Apostle Paul speaking here. The weapons we fight, the weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. So we don't fight as the world does. When we see uh, political groups drawing lines and throwing bombs back and forth of each other, you know, spend, sending you know, Twitter notes and Instagram uh, posts back and forth at each other, you know, one trying to put the other one down more than the other. When we hear people expressing their opinions about uh, things from, from sexuality to gun control to, to all the other things that we deal with today in our life and, and, the, and the attempt you know, on social media and in, and in private conversation is to tear that person down, those are not the weapons we fight with. Those are the weapons of the world. We fight with divine weapons that demolish strongholds. And remember, strongholds are mental prisons. So what a stronghold is, it's a mental prison. It's a lie that you have believed about yourself. So today, let's look at two weapons, actual two weapons, all right, uh, that we can use, that we can go into battle with. The first weapon, not a big surprise, not incredibly um, new to you, but maybe you haven't recognized how to use this weapon. That first weapon is the Holy Spirit. So write this down, keep track of this, take notes, take a picture uh, on the, on the, of the screen. The Holy Spirit is the first weapon that you fight with. The story of Jesus' temptation in Luke chapter 4, 1 and 2. Look at this. Jesus was filled with the Holy Spirit when he left the Jordan River. <clears throat> so he had just gotten baptized. The Holy Spirit filled him, right? Um, the Spirit led him while he was in the desert where he was tempted by the devil for 40 days. 40 days. During those days, Jesus ate nothing. And so it says, at the end of those 40 days, he was hungry. He was hungry. Well, unlike God, my friends, Satan is not omnipresent, which means Satan can't be everywhere. God can be everywhere. God is here with us right now. And he's also with all the brothers and sisters in Kenya right now, okay? But Satan himself, even though he's not he can only be one place at a time. He himself showed up to go to war with Jesus. And then he sends his minions on his behalf to go to war with the rest of us. Um, as is often the case with a demonic, a demonic attack is completely uninvited. All right? You never ask it to happen. He just shows up rudely, you know, pushing himself in. 
But like Moses and like Elijah, Jesus spent 40 days in the wilderness without any food or water. That makes it a miraculous fast. You can't live for 40 days without water. So this was a miraculous fast. By the time the tempter showed up for war, Jesus had reached his limits of humanity. Remember, he was 100% human and 100% God. From, from, this, from this, folks, we learn when our enemy is most likely to strike, to come after you, right? When you are hungry, when you're isolated, and when you are tired. Okay, so let's take a look at each, each of those three. Satan will come after you when you're hungry. When, <laughs> I, I, I think about the commercials on now, what is it, Snickers candy bar, right? Where the person is there and they're, and they're all angry and upset and, and you're hangry, right? Hungry plus, plus angry makes you hangry. You give them a Snickers bar and they calm down. And, well, there is some truth in that, right? I mean, when we're hungry, you know, I mean, look at my good buddy Zach over here who's now like, I don't know, 220 pounds. Hey, I would feed that boy every time he was hungry, all right? I mean, because I don't want him hangry, okay? Okay? So we, we, you know, you guys know what I mean. When you're hungry, all right, you get a little irritated. And what this represents is when, is any type of physical provision that we need. So whether, whether you're physically sick, whether you're in need of food, whether you're sexually deprived, okay, we, uh, we are more vulnerable to temptation when we lack the energy that we need to fight. This is often called the lust of the flesh in Scripture. When you are isolated, when we're alone and you have no close friends, you have no family there with you, uh, you can live a life of secrecy. And because of your privacy, you may be more vulnerable to sinful temptation. And so be aware of that and be sure you have accountability. Be sure you have a small group that you're part of. Be sure that you're talking to people and you're letting people know about your life, okay? Thirdly, when you're tired. When you're tired. When we get tired, our energy levels drain. And when I say tired, I don't just mean from one poor night's sleep. I'm talking about being burnt out. I'm talking about where you're just revving the engine and you're just going, 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 going. Someone has, has uh, uh, described burnout as similar to a, a race car where the driver just pushes down on the gas all the way to the floor and just buries it all the way around. Uh, a car engine can't keep up with that, no matter how well-tuned it is, and eventually the engine locks up and shuts down. And that's what happens to our bodies when we just go and go and go and go, and we don't get rest, and we don't get things that, that rejuvenate and revive us, like worship, all right? Sunday is one of the best ways to keep yourself from burning burnout, folks, because you, you worship God, you let go of yourself, you're renewed by his word, all right? You, you need time to rest and renew. But, but when you're tired, okay, or when you're injured, okay, when you're injured, that's also a time when Satan looks to attack. Maybe you're using illegal drugs. And I know in, a, in an audience this wide, people watching online, I'm sure there are people that are using drugs. You think maybe recreational drugs. Now, don't start looking around at anybody, all right? You got your own sins to worry about, okay? Okay? We all have things that we deal with. We all have our, our sins and our shortcomings before God. But there are people who deal with this. We, we know the opioid crisis in America is at epidemic levels, okay? That will make you vulnerable. What about if you overdrink? What about if you have too much to drink? You, you have too much to drink and, and you lose, you know, a, a part of your senses and such. You have just made yourself extremely vulnerable to Satan and to his attacks on you by his minions. For example, all the people that are killed by drunk drivers, can I just tell you right now, Satan wants to kill you. That is his goal. He wants to kill you. He wants to take you out. We read that in John chapter 10, verse 10, where Jesus said, the thief, which is Satan, comes to kill, steal, and destroy. Then Jesus says, but I came to give you life and to give it to you abundantly. So we need to be aware because when we, when we are vulnerable like this, when we are vulnerable through being hungry, isolated, or tired, then the enemy sees us as wounded prey 
that we become easy to devour. Living out of his full humanity, Jesus was vulnerable. We are too. Any time that we find ourselves hungry, isolated, or tired. To make matters worse, Satan and the demons do not have the limitations that we have. You ever thought about that? Demons don't get the flu. Demons don't need to go to sleep. Demons don't need to uh, get a drink of water, all right, to rehydrate. And we know this because demons are fallen angels. And what do we know about angels? In Revelation chapter 4, verse 8, it says, Without stopping day or night, they, the angels, were singing, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. No human being could continue singing in worship day and night without ceasing forever. Right? Our humanity has limits. But spirit beings do not in that sense. I'm not saying they're, not, they're unlimited. They are limited. They can only be in certain places, but they're not limited by some of the things that we are. Satan also works 24-hour shifts in order to bring us down. Revelation chapter 10, 12, verse 10. The one accusing our brothers, that's Satan. He's called the accuser of the brethren, the accuser of the sisterin. The one accusing them day and night. Day, so say, day and night. We're being accused by him, right? So, so how can we as human beings with finite energy possibly win a battle against spirit beings who have the benefit of being able to war against you day and night without needing a, a meal, a nap, a drink of water, or even a day off? Amen. That's the answer right there. Your power is finite. My power is finite. But the Holy Spirit's power is, say it with me, yes. infinite is infinite. That is the number one weapon that we have against the devil. So think about where Jesus' temptation happened in a barren, lonely, desolate wilderness. Folks, it is better to have the Spirit and nothing else than to have everything else without the Spirit. All right? Amen. And so we need to pray. When you get up in the morning, I invite you to pray. Pray over yourself. You go to bed tonight. Hit your knees before the Lord. Lean over beside your bed and pray. Holy Spirit, cover me tonight. Protect me against any attack from the devil. Holy Spirit, I pray you'll protect my husband. Protect my, my, my wife. Holy Spirit, I pray you'll protect my kids. Lord, I pray that you will build an impenetrable hedge of angels around this home. That, that, that no weapon formed against us will prosper. Holy Spirit, I I pray for good sleep tonight. I pray for peace that passes all understanding tonight. Let my heart and my mind be set on you. In Jesus' name, amen. And you get up and you go to bed and you rest well and in peace because the Holy Spirit is at work for you even while you're sleeping because you've asked him to do so. And it's what he wants to do. You do the same thing in the morning when you get up. Just get up, pull those covers off, get over here, legs beside the bed. I know it's cold these days when you pull the covers off, right? So you're sitting there and just pray, Holy Spirit, fill me up today. I got a lot to do today, Holy Spirit. Fill me up. Protect me, Holy Spirit. Protect my spouse. Protect my children. Do that little routine again. Help me to have great effectiveness today. Help me to be successful in what I put my hand to. Help me to be compassionate. Give me your eyes, Jesus. Let me see people the way you see them today, Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. You pray a prayer like that, you are ready to go into battle. How long did that take me? Three minutes? Do you all have three minutes? Yeah, yeah, how many of you will commit to pray tonight before you go to bed and to pray the Holy Spirit all over you? Come on now, show some courage. Show some courage, get your hands up. There you go, there you go, there you go. The rest of your hands down, I'm praying for you. You need help, you need help. All right, the second weapon we have is identity. And I gotta do this quickly, we have communion today and I'm so excited for communion today. Um, the way, see, the way you see yourself is your identity. And we covered this a lot in the, in the, in the previous series. Your identity, it's, kind of, it's what you call your self-esteem or, or your, your uh, self-image. Whenever you hear somebody talk about that, they're talking about your identity. It's a hot topic today, right? Everybody's talking about your identity. Everybody's talking about you know, choosing your identity and this kind of thing. It's a, and it's a particularly dangerous situation for, for children and for teenagers and for, for young adults. But, but listen to this. You form your identity in one of two ways. That's it. You have two choices. You form your identity in one of two ways. You either achieve it by yourself 
or you receive it from God. That's it. You can achieve it by yourself or receive it from God. When you achieve your identity by yourself, folks, it will create all kinds of problems for you. All kinds. Guys, no, I just love you so much. And anybody listening, I love you so much. I want to save you a boatload of trouble. I want you to know that when you do things God's way, things just work out better. And believe it or not, I could even prove that statistically if I needed to. Um, it's a spiritual thing, but it's even been proven statistically. For starters, here's the thing. If you wrap your identity around your role, whatever role it is that you play in life, right? Are you a mother? Are you a wife, okay? Are, are you a husband or a father? Um, are, you a, are you a winner? Are you a friend? You know, is, is it your looks? You know you're good looking. You know that, that, you know, this is a part of your identity, how you look, right? Here's what happens. When your role changes, it will always send you into an identity crisis. If your identity is based on the role that you play, so moms, your role. I'm a mother. That's what I do. When your kids go off to school and suddenly you're an empty nester, what do you have left? Wow, my role was that of being a mother. You know, that's what I did. That's who I was. Okay? Now you're in trouble. Now you got to figure out something else. How about being a spouse? How about, how about, the fa- how about being good looking? Maybe, you know, you, you, you're a person who's been attractive your whole life and, you know, you know this, people tell you you're pretty, you know, this sort of thing. Well, here's the pro- problem. Life catches up to us, right? Life catches up to us. And I'm going to say this. I'm going to embarrass somebody to death right now, but it's okay because I know she loves me. Unless you're Wendy Kazin. The girl doesn't age. I don't know what the deal is, all right? I, most of you guys know Wendy. She's sitting in back here. She'll get, she'll get me later, I know. You know, my, Ruthie and I, my wife and I talk about this. Does, does she ever get older? You know, I mean, what is she drinking? We want some of that, you know? Um, but, but the rest of us age, all right? The rest of us get older, you know? And, and so your beauty is going to fade. It's going to fade. It absolutely will in some way or another. And, and so what happens when you can no longer be identified as the beautiful person? You see, if your identity is wrapped up in a role, you are in trouble. And I so want to help you with that before you get there. No, let your identity be wrapped up in Jesus. Let it be wrapped up in Jesus. How you think, all right? The Mastermind series, we just finished. Your life is always moving in the direction of your strongest thoughts. Always moving in the direction of your strongest thoughts. You see... When you know that you are a loved child of God and your identity in relationship to your heavenly father cannot be changed, get this, you are free to stop living for your identity, okay, what everybody else thinks of you, and that's what it means to live in a, in, in a role, okay, do everybody think I'm beautiful? Great, then I feel good about myself. Does everyone like my posts? Great, I feel good about myself right? It's, it's all these things. Do, you know, do my kids love me? Are they, do they love me as a mom? Great. I feel good about myself, right? Folks, it is a dead end street. It will leave you sad, lonely, and depressed, all right? But, but here's the thing. Living, when you stop living for your identity, something that is never secure, and start living from your identity, it is eternally secure. Because of this, when Satan attacks, he's always undermining your sense of identity. Always. In his attack on Adam and Eve, he told them that they did something. If you do something, okay, Genesis, take a look at it, chapter 3. If you would eat the forbidden fruit... See, he's telling them that they have to achieve something. you got to do something to get your identity. Right? That was his attack on them. Then they would achieve becoming like God. And it was nothing but a big fat lie. For so many of you, you think, if I just do this, then I'm going to have this. And it's a big fat lie from Satan. Now, I'm not saying you shouldn't work hard. I'm not saying you shouldn't achieve at a high level. I think you ought to go for it. I think Christian people ought to be great workers. I think Christian people ought to be great students. I think Christian people ought to set the trend for integrity and character and lead the way as leaders in our society. Absolutely. But you cannot get your identity from that. 
you, you flow out of your identity as a child of God, which means you cannot fail because your Father in heaven will never reject you. He will never turn his back on you. He will never leave you. And that's the promise we have from God. And that's why you want your identity completely wrapped up in him. Am I making sense? Are you tracking with me? You get it? Amen? Do I get an amen? All right. All right. So here's the thing. Luke chapter 4 verse 3. The devil said to Jesus. Look at this. It's the same tactic. If you are the son of God, tell this stone to become a loaf of bread. He was attacking Jesus' identity. But Jesus was 100% human here, folks. Don't think that as God, this wasn't even, it was like, oh, no, no problem. No, this was real. He felt this every bit as much as you and I would have. God the Father spoke the very identity from heaven over Jesus that happened at his baptism. You are my son. That's your identity. And for those of you who are followers of Christ, he looks at you ladies and he says, you are my daughter. Nothing can change that. No one can change that. You're mine. And I love you with an everlasting love. Sons, men, he says to you, you are my son. Just like he said to Jesus, when you receive the free gift of salvation that Jesus offers, he says the same thing to you. You are my son. And I will never leave you. And I will never forsake you. And I will always be with you. And no matter what you do in life, I will love you and I will have your back. That's the promise from the Father. Come on, people. Can I get an amen for that? Come on now. Oh, that was a good place to quit. All right, um, we actually have two more temptations uh, that, um, that Jesus, I didn't plan on getting to those today. I'm going to actually pick this up next week uh, with a temptation account and look at the next two temptations that Jesus faced because they're critical to us understanding how to battle temptation that comes our way because God wants us to live holy lives. God loves us. He loves us the way we are. He forgives us for all of our sin, no matter what it is. But he does want us to live holy lives. He does want us to be more like Jesus every day. And that's why we do things like the growth track to help you move in your walk with Jesus Christ. You see, think about it. When you become a Christian, you are what? Born what? Again, you're born again. When you are born, when you're a brand new baby, right? You've got your whole life in front of you, don't you? Okay, when you are born again, you are a spiritual baby. That means you have your whole spiritual life ahead of you. Okay, becoming a Christ follower and getting baptized is not the end game. It's the start of the of the journey. All right, there's a whole lifetime of spiritual growth that that God has for you if you will follow him. But it will be a pathway absolutely. mm, Wrought is the word that comes to mind. Wrought with with temptation and trials and pain and difficulty. But somehow when you have Jesus in the middle of that, you say, I'm okay. I'm going to be okay because you know what? I'm not living for earth. I'm not living for my retirement. I'm living for heaven. I'm living for the day that I get to go home and be with Jesus. Let's pray.